Perfect. Okay, so this is chapter nine, um, global function approximation, and we're going to do this in two weeks. This first week, I'm hoping to cover the um, parts up until uh, all the stuff I do with polynomials, and then the second half, I uh, hope to finish off the rest with the Fourier series stuff and using these types of approximations for um, integrals, right? So let's see if I can find the work the technology today. Okay, so you can see hopefully my Visual Studio code. I have yet to find a really good solution to um, presenting. I know that Andrew has a great way. I gotta find out what, exactly what he's doing, but I'm still using my Jupyter notebooks here to, uh, to work through these. And these are just my own notes that I made. Uh, so I don't have any special slides or anything for this. Unlike with R, with R Markdown and Quarto, I just cannot get that to work so well with uh, Julia. I did it the first time and it was such a struggle that I've kind of decided I'm just gonna keep going this way. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this works. If you have trouble with something that I'm saying or, or can't read what I, what I have here, just let me know. And of course, as always, interrupt with your own observations, with corrections or whatever. So uh, the first part of this chapter, when you first started, you're like, oh, wait a minute, didn't we already do this already? <laughs> Polynomial approximation, it sounds familiar. And I guess what my view is the difference is instead of looking at, we've got some data points and we're trying to approximate the polynomial, here we're actually looking at for approximation of a function. And so we can freely choose where we want to sample that function in order to then create the approximation for it. And that's kind of what the global approximation part of that is. Uh, and also before we only really touch briefly on the polynomial interpolation, we jumped root directly from that because it didn't work that well. I remember when you have noisy data, it tended to overfit and you end up with, of course, all kinds of oscillations. And so in instead, at that point, we jumped into piecewise polynomials. Now we're going to go back to the full, um, you know, n polynomials for n data point type thing. Yeah, and order n polynomial for n data points, or is it n minus one, whatever, you know what I mean. <laughs> exactly the right order for the number of points you have. So, right, so that's a, this is the overview. This chapter is going to talk about the interpolation based on polynomials and then talk about beyond polynomials using trigonometry function, basically a Fourier series, and then wraps up with uh, applying these to numerical integration. You can think of other applications too, like you have a function, you, it takes a long time to calculate, like you have to integrate a whole bunch of things to calculate it, uh, but you have, you know, you can calculate certain fixed values and smoothly interpolate and use that in your additional analysis that you're doing. So recall before we had, oh, I remember now, so it's, you have n plus one data points. <laughs> this catch, this throws me off in this chapter multiple times where it's confusing, right? So there's n plus one. So they start at zero, which Julia does not do, right? <laughs> It goes all the way up to n, so it's kind of extra points on both ends, sort of. <clears throat> so um, the goal was to find a polynomial degree n, so that all the points exactly match the, the data points. And they give a theorem in this chapter um, that, this is on my way, theorem in this chapter that if the nodes are all distinct, that is the time points, or I guess they don't have to be time, but whatever, the t points are all distinct, then there does exist a unique polynomial p of degree at most n that satisfies that for all k. Um, so for proof of existence, we'll see that in a minute when we show how to construct that polynomial explicitly. We already know one way to do that by solving that van der Waals equation thing, but we'll find a, a nicer way in some way. And then finally, for the proof of existence, you just have to consider two polynomials. If you did have two different interpolated polynomials, uh, you would have one at degree at most n uh, and so you know it has n plus one roots that must all be zero. So that's just a fundamental theorem of algebra. If you have that many zero roots, then your function can only be zero, basically, right? So it's just fundamental theorem algebra, which he, algebra, which he also uses again um, when discussing this Lagrange formula, which we're going to talk about now. So this um, is a method for calculating um, the interpolating polynomial in like a, a more straightforward way, I guess, in some sense. It's kind of like you're just thinking, well, how can I make this thing fit? Well, I just take all these factors of 
x minus t because I know it'll be zero at those points. And at the one that is not zero, that'll tell me how it has to, has to fare, right? Um, in, in very rough terms. But this is called, I, this is supposed to call us back to in 5.2, we talked about the cardinal basis. So in, the, in that case, we had a cardinal basis and they were just uh, for, for piecewise interpolation, they were like hat functions, remember? Um, little, you know, the little hat function there zero everywhere, but one at the one point that we care about. But now we're talking about polynomials that have that same property, except we only care that there's zero at the particular other data points and then one at the one data point we're trying to fit at right now. Um, and so everywhere else in between those data points, it can be anything. I'll go all over the place and it's fine. And so the text uh, shows a derivation of this based on the fundamental theorem of algebra, but it's, it's almost straightforward that you can just see, you can write down that I just have to write down X, you know, for all except the one point I'm trying to do, one point I want to do one at, all the other ones I just have factors of X minus T1, X minus T2, not three if I'm trying to do three, and X minus T4 and so on. And that will satisfy the one property. And then just to make it satisfy the other property that it's one, we just have to normalize it. And that's what this is right here. So um, when you have that basis, then at this L sub K, if you have these functions L sub K of X, then it's very straightforward to write down the interpolating polynomial. You just write down the sum of all the L sub Ks, the little hat functions, well, no, not hat functions anymore, but these cardinal functions, and multiply by the value that Y has to have at that point, and you're done. So it's a very simple existence proof that you can uh, make such a polynomial. And it's also actually somewhat convenient if you're trying to do something paper and pencil and you've got some points you want a quick polynomial interpolate polynomial, you can actually do this by hand pretty easily. It's something I've, I've had to do before in the past when you, oh, I got these points, you need a quick polynomial, boop, 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 you're done. But it's got fine for like, you know, you just want like second order, right? If you gotta go too many orders, it gets probably a little hairy for doing by hand. <clears throat> okay, so that's the Lagrange uh, formula, Lagrange cardinal basis. Now we want to talk about, uh, as always in this text, you're like, okay, that was great. No, oh, now we got to talk about errors. Of course, it always comes down to spend a lot of time talking about errors because this is a numerical calculation thing and errors matter. So they introduce and this thing called the error indicator function, which is similar to those Lagrange basis functions, just a set of factors, except now it's all n factors. So it's zero at all the data points, right? Uh, so it's just x minus t zero, x minus t one, da, da, all, all multiplied together. So everywhere, um, everywhere on the where the function points exist, it's zero. But everywhere else, it could do all kinds of things. And the reason for introducing that is that the text shows that if you have that, then the error in the interpolation that is f the true function minus your polynomial p, the um, polynomial interpolation is bounded. Or not bound up as equal actually to this function here, which depends on this phi function. And it also depends on knowing some special point. I guess the way they state it is this way there exists some number of C such that uh, between A and B, this error is equal to this, right? So the error is equal to this phi of X multiplied by this constant, which we don't know necessarily how to get, but you need to know the N plus one derivative of F, and you also have to find. Uh, where this special C is. And the text shows you how you, by construction, in proving this by construction, they show you how to get C, but you don't actually need it, right? You can just use this as a bound. You just find the maximum of the n plus one derivative between A and B, and then you'll be, you'll know at least it's bounded by that much. And, and really the important part is it depends on this, this uh, phi function. Uh, they also show as a corollary that if, um, in the special case where the steps are constant size, then this error is bounded now by this, the h to the n plus one is the important factor there. So it's n plus one order in, uh, in the step size. Does that make sense there? Did it make sense to you guys when you're reading it? Because it does, he does talk about when he goes through the book, like how to find the C, it's a solution to something. I forget what it was now. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me, but. And later when he uses it, he doesn't actually try to solve that every time. He says, oh, the most it see, this, this function can be is this, so the error has to be bounded by that. It's, it's like the remainder term from a Taylor series, kind of. It yeah. has that, right? It is, yeah. yeah. It's, just, yeah that, it's like the n plus one derivative, and there's the n plus one factorial you get right in the Taylor series. Yeah. In any event, um, Let's take a look at those Lagrange polynomials. So the one of the exercises asks us to consider 
uh, t equals zero, t equals one, and t equals beta, where beta is something bigger than one. And then we're going to write out those Lagrange polynomials, and then we're going to set x equal to a half, and then suppose also that y one equals y two, and see what happens as beta gets close to uh, as beta gets close to one, um, and that is t one t two get close very close to each other. And I guess we're supposed to find some problems in subtractive cancellation in this, right? So I did this um, for writing down the Lagrange cardinal polynomials is straightforward. You just have to, again, it's for each one, you just write down the factors that are not, right? <laughs> not that point. So for t equals zero, t zero, right? So I have to subtract x minus, or sorry, multiply the factor x minus one, x minus beta, that's the other two points. So this is zero, those other two points. And then for x equal to zero, it is one. Why do I have a t there? That's a mistake, that should be a one. It should be just be divided by beta. I hope that doesn't fall through everything else I do. <laughs> I just realized that was in there. Um, should just fix that over here. Sorry, it's gonna drive me crazy. I think that's said T zero at one point, but or T one, I think at some point. Oh, did I lose myself? Okay. So now we can see it satisfies the right constraint. Where X equals zero, this is one, right? Good. <laughs> That's what we want. And the same thing for the other two. We can find those Lagrange polynomials the same way. Um, X equals one, this works. And I'm just checking to make sure I did this right. X equals beta, yeah, this works. Okay, good. Hopefully in part B, I didn't care, continue forward through that error I made. I did though, there it is, that T. What, is it? what are we doing with that T? Go away, T. Oh, so it doesn't actually matter because I don't care about this term and the rest of it. So <laughs> that error doesn't actually matter. So anyway, we're going to set x equal to one half. So we're going to write down the polynomial for x equals one half. It's just y zero times L zero at a half, y one times L one and a half, y two times L two at a half. That's straightforward. So I just plug and chug in this thing. Uh, there's that T sticking around there. It doesn't really matter um, because what I really want to look at this y one term where you can see we're going to get some problems because as beta gets close to one, we're going to have an infinity and we're going to have a zero in the denominator. And we're also going to have a zero in the numerator. And unless things uh, go perfectly, which they don't, right, then we could expect to have subtractive cancellation in, in that case, right? Because these don't perfectly cancel. This can't be simplified any, well, it can be simplified a little bit, but it can't be simplified in a term one minus beta. It's not the same as one minus beta. So subtractive cancellation is going to be an issue there. Or could be, I should say, it could be an issue. That's that's what I got for basically for that one. Um, did you anyone else do this problem and have any feedback on it? I think this is what they're trying to get at. Is that in the is it there's a subtraction when beta goes to one, this is zero, beta goes to one, this is zero, but they go to zero at different rates. It does converge, that's a limit, it's like three halves. I checked it. Uh, so it's not like it is indeterminate, but it's still a subtractive cancellation case. And my understanding is less it exactly perfectly cancels, it can cause issues, right? So the top and the bottom both go to zero, right? That's yes. beta and it goes to one, yeah. yeah. And there is a well-defined limit, it's three halves. Three halves. Yeah. So it's not a problem from the point of view of the limit, but good in numerical errors, it is a problem. Um, numerical yeah. subtraction. Supposedly, I mean, I tried messing around with a little bit with, you know, adding epsilon flow 64. I couldn't actually make it kind of big problems. If I, if I evaluate it, so here's the half, three halves, right? So if I say, okay, what is, uh, so the last term, I just wrote out what this last term was, right, without the y, right? And I said, okay, what is it if I add epsilon, right, for flow stage four, it nicely is one half, <laughs> it's no problem. If I try to evaluate exactly at one, man, so I don't know. <laughs> Strange. Anyway. I don't know. I think I feel like I'm supposed to get something else out of that than I did, but that's what I got. <laughs> Anyone else has any feedback? Let me know. The next, uh, so what we're supposed to find out from that exercise is that these things can be numerically unstable. And so they say, okay, well, there's a better way that is known to be numerically, numerically stable called the very centric formula. And it's apparently also more efficient because we don't have to calculate n terms for each evaluation of the Turpillian polynomial at each new point. And this has this very strange formula, which looks not any, anything like a polynomial, right? It's like a ratio of two terms uh, with, uh, with 
you know the the factors in that the denominator uh, with these weights are given by this formula, the very centric weights. So the question, uh, and then they, as an exercise, by the way, they actually show you, they ask you to show, it's not hard that um, this really is phi prime, one over this phi prime really is, is this uh, thing in the denominator here. It's not hard to see. So the text shows how this can be implemented in an iterative fashion and shows without proof that, that this is numerically stable, this method of doing the, of doing the polynomial. And that this really is a polynomial. Right? It doesn't seem obvious, but when you actually look at a particular case, it all works out to be a polynomial. And so I just here I'm just about, I'm just introducing the, the I'm not going to work through this. You probably did it yourself when you went through the text, but I didn't. I did not going to work through the uh, all the steps in this code. But it's basically implementing the iterative way of doing it that they mentioned. Let me just check something real quick though, because I feel like I'm leaving something important now. Hang on, hang on one second. Yeah, no, that is how they do it. It seems now that I've written this out, I'm like, did they actually demonstrate? Yeah, they do in the text, they give an example that shows how this is. Okay. Is it obvious to you that that's a polynomial? It's not to me. <laughs> But this thing turns into a polynomial. No, it's not obvious to me either. It to me, it looks like a weighted average, and then yeah. you there's yeah. some form of like in, it looks like inverse weighting, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Lagrange polynomial has like the x minus tk, and then divided by tk minus tj, and then you mul and then you multiply them all together, right? right? But this one is like the pro you multiply together all the tk minus tjs this time. So it's like, it, it looks a little bit, uh, I mean- You're all about you're adding them. But yeah. 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 For now, it looks like a weighted average to me, but uh, yeah, I, I guess the book has uh, has a demo to- Yeah, they have a demo that shows you that works. It does turn into a polynomial. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. They write out for one particular case and they say, Further algebraic manipulation could turn this expression into the classical Lagrange form derived. He actually doesn't do it. So it's still kind of a mess that he leaves it off. I they really just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a matter of multiplying the top and bottom by that phi function, right? Because then the, all those, then you'll get a sum of terms where each one of these, um, uh, the phi function remember, has a product of all the x minus t's. So if you imagine multiplying phi by one of the terms in the denominator here or in the numerator, You'll see that it'll, it'll just this x minus t will just divide out that one, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. Kind of, that's kind of the proof that they use in the book to show that this works, right? So yeah. if I multiply, if I put a phi here, let's say the k equals zero term, then this will turn into w k, uh, y k, um, and it'll turn into that the Lagrange polynomial essentially, or a normalized Lagrange polynomial, just all the products of x minus t except for this one that I just divided out. So that's kind of what how that works, but it's, when you look at it in, by itself, it's like, what? <laughs> how can that possibly be a polynomial? Yeah. And the yeah, bottom I, gives you the normalization the same way. I didn't read this section, this chapter yet, but oh yeah, at first at first I was a little bit confused. I was looking at it as a function of y, but I guess as a function of x, it makes sense when you're gonna combine all these fractions that you will then have some polynomial terms. Yeah, the denominator gets sort of like canceled. And then right. but the problem is that uh, it's not very clear whether you have a polynomial function or a rational or a quotient yeah. of two polynomials, <laughs> yeah. right? That's the thing. <laughs> but it, through some sleight of hand, this fee yeah. of k sort of like works. <laughs> Whenever I see things like this, I'm, I think to myself, how did somebody come up with this? I mean, I, must have been, <laughs> I hope they got like a PhD or something for this because it's pretty crazy. <laughs> a field medal? Isn't yeah. that like the math one? <laughs> yeah. In any event, um, they define this function. I don't think I actually ended up using it. 
So we're supposed to use this poly interp function, which now uses the barycentric formula, interpolation formula, to come up with the polynomial interpolation in the sta stable way. That's the key thing. So whether we understand it or not, this is a stable way of making a, uh, a interpolating polynomial. And so I just I did work through these. Um, they're pretty straightforward, right? You just have to to, to apply the formula. I actually wrote a little function for each case to make it a little easier. Uh, so this function, so here I just, here's a thousand and one points. Uh, so I can plot the, the results, right? And then I take um, the actual points I'm supposed to do it for, um, n points. I'm gonna interpolate over n points and uh, evaluate y for those points and then do the, get the polynomial interpretation, interpolation and return it, right? So that's pretty straightforward. So we'll do it for the case they said, two, three, and four, evaluate it. And that's what you end up with for like n equals two. So the true function is this 10 hyperbolic tangent function. And then like for n equals two is not very good at all, but it gets better and better as I use more and more points. And so that's, that's all great. Um, did I skip one? I did, I skipped one, that's okay. So, and you could do this for all of them. I, you know, this is for the, I skipped C, I did D for the heck of it, that's absolute. I did D because it's absolute value, which you, know, you wouldn't expect absolute value to work very well. And it, and it surely doesn't work that well, right? You can't possibly, it's hard to get this cusp here um, with, a, with a smooth polynomial. And if you go up in higher orders, it doesn't, actually, let's try it. How about N equals, I bet you this is gonna be a big oscillating mess, but I'll try N equals 12, that's the number. About it. Yeah, it turns into, yeah. So here we can see this run G phenomenon we're gonna get to in a minute um, where <laughs> you run into trouble. Speaking of that, stability of polynomial term. Now this is a different kind of stability. Numerical stability we got now. We got that thanks to this um, very centric formula. But still the whole idea of polynomial interpolation is, is how is that, how's that stability work out? And so the book gives this example of like we're gonna take, oops, what function are we doing again? What was F? Is it the absolute value? Oh, no. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I missed it. I scrolled ahead. <laughs> That's my fault. Sorry about that. So here's the function. It's the sine of the exponent of 2 times x, right? And we can do interpolation with that uh, for, let's say, n equals 6. And it looks like this. You see, oh, kind of overshoots here, comes in, looks pretty good, looks pretty good, overshoots here, and looks kind of bad at the end. And by the way, this business of being bad at the ends is... Uh, what we're going to find out happens very generally. It does better in the middle, and then for equal space points, it does worse on the edges. And this is this Runge phenomena. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, so if we increase, so this now we're going to look at the error, overall error being the max, who's using the maximum or infinite norm, I guess. So the maximum error. And between the uh, true function and the interpolant as a function of the number of nodes. And yeah, as you increase the number of nodes, the error goes down, 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 down. When you get to n equals 30, um, it gets to 10 to the minus whatever this is, 10 to the minus 10 maybe. And then it starts going up as you get more points. What is going on there? There's some instability going on. And it has to do with what happens at the ends. It's called the Runge phenomena. Uh, it's a consequence of the error grows near the ends of the boundaries of the interval. And we can see this by looking at this error function again, phi, how it looks. What? All right, nice. Oh, you know what? This is a weird thing the Visual Studio does to me all the time. When you evaluate a cell, it jumps like to the next one. I don't know why it does that. Anyway, this is, you can see, as we increase the number of echo space nodes, that the error on the edges dominates on the edges of the error function. Remember, phi is some kind of bound of the error, right? And it shows you the, the dependence on x of the error in any event, right? The rest of the terms that error bound did not depend on x, only this. So you can see that the error is like orders of magnitude higher, 20 order, or 10 orders of magnitude higher for n equals 50 on the edges than it is in the middle. And the way you solve this problem is not use equispace nodes. <laughs> so again, here's another way it turns out things. Uh, it turns out there's these Chebyshev points, and this is related to, when we come to it later, the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, Chebyshev points that you find this way. They're basically um, the point, if you take a circle and uh, take points equispaced around a circle and then project them onto the x-axis, 
you'll have points with that spacing. So they'll be closer toward the edges, right? And more spaced out toward the, toward the ends. And the, this is the calculation then to find those, oh, for the interval minus one to one. So we're gonna restrict for here on out from the, the function from minus one to one. We'll have to do rescaling if we wanna use some other interval, but from minus one to one, uh, if you use these points given by this formula, you will get Chebyshev uh, points, which are, are nicely stable for um, for the bear, for the I'm sorry for the uh, um, for the error because we have more points. This has more points toward the edge end, end points of the uh, interval. He also says as a bonus, it turns out the uh, Chebyshev uh, the barycentric weights for the Chebyshev nodes are simple. It turns out. He doesn't really use this fact uh, immediately, or as far as I can tell, but that's what it is. They're just constants, they're one half or one, and with a minus one oscillating. So if we look at the uh, the error indicator function phi for the Chebyshev nodes, then it look it's nice, right? The error is relatively constant across the whole um, interval from minus one to one because we have more points at the edge to offset this issue. In fact, you might argue here that we maybe have too many points because it seems like we're going down instead of being constant. But So they say that um, as n goes to infinity now, it's stable. As n goes to infinity, the error goes to zero uh, exponentially fast. Assuming, uh, by the way, I leave off some of these things in my notes, but throughout this whole thing, they're constantly reminding us. So this is for analytic functions, f, right? And so uh, kind of leaves off things like the exponential function. But um, in any event, there exists... Uh, the point is that there exists some constant c and some constant k greater than one such that the error then is bounded by this k to the, is less than k to the minus n, c times k to the minus n. The text calls this spectral convergence. Um, I don't understand what they're calling, what they're talking about there, to tell you the honest truth. Why spectral convergence is the name for this, because there's no spectral, I guess because it's involving a behind this, as we'll see, we're gonna start talking about uh, basis functions and, and when you talk about basis functions, sometimes people talk about it's kind of by analogy with like a spectral, the spectrum of an operator. But I don't know if that's exactly what's going on there. And I kind of wish I hadn't gone down that road when I was talking about. So never mind, forget all that. Let's go back to the exercises. Exercise 9.35. Um, oh, this is about what I just said. So if the interval is not minus one to one, what can we do? Well, we can just do a change of variable. We can find some function phi that takes us from um, the interval that we, well, in this case, we're going from minus one to one to the interval we want to. So X is minus one to one. That's the one we're going to use the interpolation on. And Z is now, you can see, you can verify yourself that if X is minus one, uh, then this is A. And if X is plus one, then this is B, right? That's part A of the exercise. Uh, part B is to invert it. And parts, so we'll just do that. Um, is algebra, right? So X is this, you can verify that it actually works. Z is A, um, this is zero, we get minus one, and Z is B. This is um, one, two minus one is one, so that works, so that we've inverted it properly. Um, so part C, now we're gonna do, um, let's see, what does it say here? So C is another one to show that in fact, that if we do take a polynomial interpretation, polynomial uh, interpolation on Z, that it's also a polynomial interpolation on X, which is phi inverse of Z, right? And so, or I should say it the other way, um, P is our standard interpolating polynomial on an interval of minus one to one. Um, it's a function of X, which is phi inverse Z. And then we want to just verify that that is still a polynomial in the variable we care about which is Z, right? So Z is the variable we care about, X is this minus one to one re regime. But it's pretty easy to see because X phi inverse, you can look by inspection here, you can see phi inverse is a linear function of Z. So whatever powers of X there are, there's gonna be, any power of X is gonna be a polynomial in Z, therefore it has to still be a polynomial. Pretty straightforward, right? Finally, the part D asks us to implement this to do a polynomial interpolant for f of z, which is defined here as hyperbolic cosine or the sine of z over zero to pi using n plus one Chebyshev nodes, right? With n equals 40. So I do that. 
here. So first, um, I define this function f935 because this is a problem 935, and I keep running this problem where if I redefine symbols, sometimes it complains. It's part of Julia I don't quite understand yet. So there's the function. Um, there's, oops, there's t over the, now this is my, um, this t right here I'm using for plotting purposes of the whole function is a thousand and one points. Good enough for the Arabian Nights, good enough for me. Um, so this is the function, this is what it looks like. Now we find the Chebyshev points. Um, now this is just something that doesn't depend anything about the function we're working with. This is any function from minus one to one, if we want 41 Chebyshev points, this is how we do it. So that's straightforward. Um, we want to now convert those um, points to our function, our range zero to two pi. So we're going to do that by using that uh, uh, conversion function, right? And then we can, the reason, why do I need to do that? Because I want to evaluate F, right? F is from zero to two pi. So I'm going to map the range from minus one to one to zero to two pi in a linear way, and then evaluate Y. Now I've got Y at my Chebyshev points. This is what I need to do the interpolation. So I plug this in to the interpolating function. Now I still need to plot the interpolating function. So now I'm going to take T and convert it <laughs> right to the, to the range where I can evaluate, to the Z, uh, uh, coordinate system so I can plot the interpolate. So it's, it's just a matter of swapping back and forth properly between the two coordinate systems. If you do that, you can plot on top of each other. In fact, they're just smack on there. For 40 points, you can't tell just the original function and the interpolating function at all. They're just right on top of each other. So it works. And I did it right. That's the key thing. You can tell you did it right with the, it, the whole trick here is just getting back and forth between the, the two spaces with the linear mapping. All right, so now the, how much time do I have? I'm good, doing good. Okay, any uh, questions? Ron, so before we move uh, on, yes. Yeah, Ron, the, so you were doing F935, right? Yeah. So if you do, if you don't do that, th does this uh, notebook of yours compile still? Will just It will just give you warnings, but it will still work through, right? Without going through F, un F underscore 935. I don't think it'll do anything now because whatever that the other F was that was conflicting is gone now. So <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Just when I was working through, I'm like, ah, it's all right, fine, I'll just do this <laughs> just to get it done. So <laughs> yeah, for for our markdown, I use the same F actually. I use the same notation. It just spews out some warnings, but yeah, I, yeah. It's, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's that part. Now we're gonna move on to orthogonal polynomials. So the point here was, okay, that was interpolation. Let's instead now look at doing kind of a least squares fit uh, on the interval. I say a generalization of least squares fit, excuse me, along the interval uh, of some set of basis functions. Excuse me. So the idea here is that we are gonna get some set of basis functions unspecified at the moment. And we have our function. We wanna somehow make some linear combination of those basis functions as close as possible to our target function over the entire interval. One way you could do that is by just sampling, you know, I don't know, 100 points and doing the old, the least squares we already know how to do, right? Um, just fitting, right? Just doing a standard regression, right? Um, but we, we can do it more generally than that without having to take the finding number of points by using, by doing it through all the points. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. And so for to do that, he wants to define some generalizations of the matrix things we've done before, but now for functions. And so the first one is the inner product, uh, inner product with two functions. He, this is, by the way, not the only way, as he'll show, in, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, only way to find an inner product between two functions. But this is one way to find an inner product between two uh, real functions. It's the integral of the product of them, right? Um, he also uses that same inner product to define a two norm for functions. And then finally, as always, if the inner product is zero, we say the two vectors are orthogonal. So let's say two functions are orthogonal if this inner product is zero. But you can see this is a, just a generalization of the inner. If this was a finite number of points, it would be like two vectors which represent the functions at some fixed number of points, right? All we've done is taken a limit, and now the sum becomes an integral. So then we're into some more definitions. He, uh, if you have a set of functions, these are basis functions, f1 through fn. He wants to define something uh, this quasi matrix, which is a vector of those functions, right? But it's not, a, we're not going to call it a vector, we're going to call it a quasi matrix. We're thinking of it as an infinity by n matrix, where the infinity part is the x variable. 
going from minus one to one in this case. We're still restricting ourselves to the minus one to one interval, by the way. Um, let's see, so we can define then a matrix vector product F times Z in this way. That makes a, a you know, an infinite dimensional vector, right? <laughs> and we can go the other way uh, by defining a joint product of, of some other function, right? So function F transpose G, this defines an n-dimensional make vector with just a, this uh, vector of inner products, okay? So those are kind of the general, oh, sorry, one more thing, F transpose F makes a matrix, an N by N matrix. It's just the matrix of the inner products between all the possible inner products between the, the functions and the basis set. So with that generalization, and if you take it as a, uh, as a matter of faith that everything works like it does by analogy with the, uh, with the discrete case, we can use the same normal equation thing um, to say, okay, the least squares fit then between our function y and this set of basis functions, what the least fit coefficients are is given by this same normal equation we know and love. But now with this generalized thing, this gram matrix, this matrix transpose, uh, this generalized matrix transpose, but with functions involved now, right? So this is kind of, so he does go through and show like with some arbitrary set where you can do things with this, but almost always you're like, okay, great. Give me some functions that are orthogonal so that this matrix here is nice and simple, uh, preferably diagonal. And that's what we're gonna do next. So the first set of functions is the Legendre polynomials, which are given by this recurrence relation. Uh, you've probably seen this before. I know I have seen this before. It's pretty well, understood, well pretty common. Um, the first one's one, the next one's X, and then you recur in this way to calculate the next higher up ones. But you can just, you know, these are all, these are in many, many libraries um, for every language you can imagine using because they're <laughs> extremely useful. Uh, they have, now the inner product is not one, unfortunately, but it is, it is, they are orthogonal. So the inner product is actually this um, alpha sub i squared thing. Wait, that doesn't seem right. Should that be a minus two? Oh, that's what it says. Okay. I guess alpha sub i is the square root of this, so that's fine. Um, yeah. And then you can write down like the quasi matrix for it, which is just the, oh, so this is quasi, so the quasi matrix is divided by this alpha so that the inner proxy will turn in to be better formed. And then using that, you can then write down um, the least squared approximation for our function, which I didn't write down, f, let's just say f equals this function, right? So for function f is this sum over these Legendre polynomials with coefficient c sub k, where c sub k is simply given by this inner product of the Legendre polynomial and your function f, right? So this integral, and that's the solution. Hopefully that was clear. So it's, it's relatively straightforward then to find your uh, approximation, just having to do some intervals. But you can do it numerically as well, right? Uh, let's see, he then talks about the Chebyshev polynomials. You probably heard of those as well. That's just using a different inner product space. Something that says you have to use the, the, the f of f times g. You can also use f times g so times multiplied by some weight function. This one or x squared, uh, if you use that, turns into, uh, you can define these Chebyshev polynomials which have a similar form, right? First one's one, next one's X, but the recurrence relation is a little bit simpler. And the other interesting thing about these is that the, um, well, that somehow it turns out that these things can also be written as T sub K is cosine of K theta, where theta is arc cosine of X, right? And so if you pick a particular K and did all the trigon pulled all your trig identities, supposedly you'll get out these things here, right? I guess for k equals zero, it's obvious. For k equals one, it's obvious. Beyond that, no, not for me. <laughs> not obvious to me. Uh, and let's see. Next thing he talks about the roots of these orthogonal polynomials. There's a theorem that all the roots and roots of Legendre polynomials are simple and real. 
Uh, the proof is just based on looking at the inner product that's in the text. I uh, didn't find it that fascinating to reproduce. Then the other interesting thing is that this, uh, for the Chevy ship polynomials, the roots, because of this um, cosine, co arc cosine thing, it uh, turns out the roots are simple for, for that case. And these are called the Chevy ship points, the first kind. Uh, the points that we used before for doing the um, uh, polynomial interpolation are Chevy ship points, the second kind. The, both of them can be used to give uh, convergence, uh, but this one, spectral convergence, but uh, it depends on whether or not the endpoints are included, is what they said. So if you don't include the endpoints, then you should use the first kind. When you do use the endpoints, like we have been doing, you should use the second kind. So they are related in that way. And I don't know if there's some set of polynomials. Obviously, there is some set of polynomials that um, two zeros are the, the first, the second kind. I don't know if they have some special properties. I don't know. I didn't look that up. But does, you know, does anyone know about that up top of your head? Sorry, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so the chapter um, also talks about, in kind of conclusion, this, this section of the chapter concludes by discussing kind of the difference between, you know, least squares and first interpolation. Um, they both project functions, whatever function you have, onto some polynomial subspace. But um, the, the least squared analysis, it involves inner products and you know so in two norms it's kind of a linear algebra type way of looking at it uh whereas and you know use the two norm as a natural choice whereas the interpolation it you know does, it doesn't have any easy connection to these kind of linear algebra things and they mentioned that if you did do analysis you'd be so it favors the complex plane and the max norm for analysis I, i'll take your word for it i don't know <laughs> i'm not planning to do that <clears throat> so let's see the last exercise i think that i'm going to do yeah, is exercise 9.4.5 says us to let's write a function that, that calculates um, the returns a matrix of, wait, I guess I didn't quite do it that way. I didn't read, I didn't read the directions very well. <laughs> Instead, I calculated, I do, this is very inefficient when I realize what I'm doing here. So I'm calculating just the Legendre polynomial. To, in this function. I just realized now you're supposed to calculate a matrix of them all in one shot, which would be a lot better <laughs> than what I'm doing because there's a lot of repeated work and I calculate the same Legendre polynomial. If I asked for the, I just realized if I asked for the nth polynomial by the this function, I calculate all the other ones over and over again to do that. So it's very inefficient. So now I know why they want to do the matrix here, but I didn't do that. I just calculated the most, this is just most straightforward way of writing down that recurrence relationship as it is. And then we can plot some of them. No big deal, right? In fact, this plot is very, very similar to, if you look up Wikipedia, Legendre polynomial, you'll see this exact same plot with, I think the signs are flipped on some of them. But, but that's what the Legendre, oh yeah, you wrote, yeah, compared to the Wikipedia. But I guess I should redo this properly and more efficiently by when I calculate all of them at one shot rather than, because you can see the inefficiency of what I'm doing, right? I, ask, I should count. Why don't I save these older, these lower uh, numbered polynomials <laughs> since they're calculated now? But anyway, okay. That's basically it for now. Um, let's see. Does that, anybody have any questions about the, oops, sorry. Let me stop sharing here. Any questions about that section? But for the next section we're going to talk about trigonometric, we call it trigonometric. Interpolation, but it's basically Fourier series. I don't know why he calls it trigonometric interpolation, but Fourier series, fast Fourier transform, fun stuff like that. Um, and then we're going to talk about spectrally accurate integration, whatever that means, and how to deal with improper interval inter, inter, uh, improper integrals, which is dealing with integrals like go out to infinity, right? Max to infinity. Yeah. I haven't actually gone through the chapter as deeply as I would if I listened to it. So. Yeah, same here. <laughs> I'll be ready next week. <laughs> it's that time of year, man. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> Tough time of year to be uh, doing spectrally accurate. The only thing, um, I need to look into this Chebby Chef guy because every, you know, they have the in statistics of Chebby Chef inequality. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. About quantiles. 
for an arbitrary probability distribution. So yep. this guy did a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Good old shibby shab. All right, I don't know. I hope that was clear. It's kind of, you know, just going, doing, hey, let me just put the stop button for us. Okay, so that concludes that section.